Christian Scholars Conference is delighted to have as our opening plenary speaker the Reverend John Polkinghorne, who embodies the wedding of science and religion. He is the winner of the 2002 Templeton Prize for Science and Religion. Dr. Alan Bradshaw, Lipscomb University Professor of Physics, consistently recognized for his outstanding teaching and a winner of the prestigious Nightingale Prize for his research on biomagnetism at Vanderbilt University, will now formally introduce our speaker, Dr. Bradshaw. When I was invited to dream about major speakers for this conference, scholars whose ideas have shaped the interface between science and religion. It was our speaker for this session who came immediately to mind. John Polkinghorne's first career began with a PhD in physics from Cambridge in 1955, working under Nobel laureates Abdus Salam and Paul Dirac. His distinguished phys physics career includes contributions to quantum theory, elementary particle physics, and even to the discovery of the quark. But after about 25 years, he made a move that in his own words caused his scientific colleagues to regard him with the same suspicion that might meet someone claiming to be a vegetarian butcher. <laughs> he resigned from science and studied to became ordained, become ordained as an Anglican priest. His ministry included various roles and eventually saw him serving as president of Queens College at Cambridge. He is one of only two ordained clergy who are fellows of the Royal Society and one of only three who are Knights of the British Empire. Interestingly, although he is knighted, it is technically incorrect to refer to him as Sir John Polkinghorne since he is also ordained in the Church of England. His impressive curriculum vitae include 34 books, 26 of which address the science-religion interface. As David mentioned, in 2002, he was awarded the prestigious Templeton Prize for progress or research towards spiritual realities. A critical realist and a bottom-up thinker, Polkinghorne relishes the partnership between science and theology in the path of discovery as he asks both domains, what makes you think that this story is a verisimilitudinous account of reality. Please join me in welcoming the eminent Reverend Dr. John Polkinghorne. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to me to be here to speak at this very remarkable and, and impressive conference. I'm very grateful for it. Now, people sometimes say the science is concerned with facts, but religion is simply concerned with opinions. In other words, science deals with what is actually true, but the best you can say about religion is that it might be true for you, in the sense of being helpful to you in coping with life, but that would amount to no more than a personal preference to seeing things in that kind of way. Now, I think that there are two bad mistakes involved in making this judgment. The first mistake is about the actual nature of scientific investigation and discovery. There are no interesting scientific facts that are not already interpreted facts. The raw output of experiments, such as readings on dials or marks on photographic plates, do not tell us anything interesting until we understand what they signify. That active interpretation requires recourse to theoretical opinion in order to know what is being detected and measured. In consequence, there is a delicate circularity in our scientific investigation of the physical world as theory is called upon to interpret experimental observations and experiments are called upon to confirm or disconfirm theories. Recognizing this circularity introduces a degree of precariousness into the enterprise, but the enormous explanatory success of science strongly encourages the belief that this circularity is benign rather than vicious. It's clear, however, <coughs> scientific discovery involves something altogether more subtle 
than simple encounter with unproblematic objectivity. Its character is more delicately intricate than the notion of confrontation between indubitable experimental fact and inexorable theoretical prediction might suggest, leading to the establishment of clear and certain ideas in the manner that the thinkers of the Enlightenment Sound has changed a bit, that's all right. <laughs> um, despite this necessary qualification, almost all scientists take a robustly realist view of their achievements, seeing them as telling us what the physical world is actually like. Those scientists who reflect on such matters will hold fast to using the noun realism to describe their attainments, but they will be willing to express the delicacy involved in the process by annexing to it the adjective critical, recognition of the somewhat oblique approach necessarily employed. Albert Einstein found it difficult to accept such a nuanced judgment. He had been one of the grandfathers of quantum physics through his analysis of the photoelectric effect in 1905. But as quantum theory grew to maturity, he came to hate his grandchild. Passionately devoted to faith in the reality of the physical world, Einstein feared that this belief would be threatened by the elusive fuzziness of a world characterized by the uncertainty principle. He made the mistake of identifying reality with naive objectivity. In fact, the essence of a true realist stance is a willingness to respect the idiosyncratic nature of what is encountered even if that nature contradicts our prior expectations or falls short of our epistemic desires. Dismissal of religion as mere opinion is the second mistake. I have a number of my friends in the scientific world who are both wistful and wary about religion. They can see that science does not every, answer every question that we want to ask. And they recognize also that religion does address many of the issues the science simply sets aside, such as questions of value and purpose. Yet they fear that science does so, rather religion does so, on unacceptable terms. Their picture of religious faith is that it involves an uncritical submission to the irrational assertions of an unquestionable authority. Of course, my friends do not commit, want to commit intellectual suicide, but then neither do I. As I have opportunity, I want to show that I have motivations for my scientific beliefs, my religious beliefs, just as I have motivations for my scientific beliefs. My friends may or may not accept the adequacy of these motivations, but they should at least be aware of their existence, prepared to give them a degree of serious consideration. Of course, the kinds of motivations for scientific beliefs and for religious beliefs are different, because they have different kinds of belief which therefore need to be assessed and supported in different ways. Science and religion are both concerned with encounters of reality, but they meet reality at different levels, involving different kinds of experience. Science explores an impersonal dimension of reality, a realm in which experience can be manipulated and repeated at the will of the investigator. And this gives science its great secret weapon, the appeal to experiment, as a means to attain a high degree of intersubjective agreement. The dust really does settle on scientific issues because in principle, and sometimes even in practice, the doubters can look for themselves and become convinced by putting matters to the empirical test. They can check the phenomena really do have the character cited in support of the proffered theoretical understanding. And even in historical sciences, such as cosmology or biological evolution, in which attention is focused on a single unrepeatable phenomenon, in the one case the unique history of the universe, the other the unique history of terrestrial life, even in these cases much reliance has to be placed on the insights of the experimental sciences, respectively physics and genetics. Theology, the intellectual reflection on religion, is concerned with two quite different levels of reality those of interpersonal human encounter and of transpersonal meeting with the sacred reality of God. In these realms, testing, 
has to do with ways of trusting. If we're always setting little traps to see if our friends really like us, we shall soon destroy the possibility of friendship between us. <laughs> it's just a fact, isn't it? And it is a simple fact of the spiritual life that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's no good standing up and saying, if there is a God, let him strike me down dead. He doesn't play those sort of stupid games. <laughs> Attempting to manipulate God is the sinful error of magic. This absence of access to repetition and the power of contrivance means that the adjective critical has particular force in relation to theological realism. Much must depend upon unique spiritual experiences of divine self-disclosure, such as those that are recorded in the scriptures of a faith tradition and are received and reinforced within the worshipping and truth-seeking life of that community. This deposit of encounter with sacred reality is what is meant by revelation, such as that which the Christian church believes, I believe rightly, of course, has been given through the history of Israel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that the Bible is not a divinely dictated textbook in which, we are, which are set forth in propositional terms all the answers to the examination questions of life. But it is much more like a laboratory notebook in which are recorded seminal acts of historic divine self-disclosure which can mediate a richness of a spiritual experience to those who open themselves to God's will and presence. Science and theology are not only concerned with different levels of encounter with reality, but they are also focused on addressing different kinds of, que of questions about reality. Science has achieved its very great success by the modesty of its ambition. It confines itself to investigating the processes of the physical world by means of which things happen. It concentrates on process, and it brackets out questions of value and purpose concerned with what is going on and what is happening. Yet we all know that the richness of reality is such that these latter questions of meaning and purpose are both meaningful and necessary to ask. To use a favorite illustration of mine, the kettle is boiling, because burning gas heats the water. That's the scientific answer. The kettle is boiling, so I want to make a cup of tea. Would you like to have one? That's a different kind of answer. We don't have to choose between those two answers. They're both true. And to understand fully the event of the boiling kettle, you need to know both of those answers. The reason that science and religion, in my view, are friends and not foes is that both are engaged in the great human quest for truth, attainable through motivated belief. In consequence, science and, religion, and theology, or science and religion, complement each other rather than being in conflict. Each is competent to address its own questions, in my view, without needing assistance from the other. We have good reason to believe that scientific questions will receive scientific answers given for scientific reasons just as theological questions will receive theological answers given for theological reasons. One is asking the question how, the other, if you like, is asking the question why in terms of meaning and value and purpose. And how and why are certainly different questions. Nevertheless, there is an interaction between science and theology because their answers must nevertheless prove consistent with each other. Saying that the kettle has just been put in the refrigerator is incompatible with the offer to make a cup of tea. The continuing and necessary conversation between science and theology arises from the fact that their independent insights must be seen to be consonant with each other, affording in their combination a more extensive and profound understanding than either, in my view, could offer on its own. The picture I've been trying to paint is that of a capacious human quest for truthful understanding, which embraces a wide spectrum of inquiry, ranging from science's engagement with impersonal reality to theology's encounter with the transpersonal reality of the divine. Now, I believe that universities exist to explore this rational spectrum, 
the whole of this rational spectrum and to witness thereby to the ultimate unity of knowledge. I'm a passionate believer in the unity of knowledge. Universities are much more the loose federations of specialized research institutions, narrowly focused on particular points in the spectrum of truth, the exclusion of wider concerns. And in consequence, a university which finds no place for theological truth seeking, in my view, is lacking in an important element in the fulfillment of its purpose. It is precisely the truth-seeking character of theology which rebuts the claims of some of the new atheists that theology has no place in a modern university. The point can be reinforced by exploring some of the cousinly relationships that exist, I believe, between the ways in which science and theology pursue their common quest for truth despite the differences of their subject matter. To explore that a bit, I have first to return to the theme of the role of motivated beliefs in both disciplines. That science derives its motivation for its beliefs from the results of experimental and observational investigation would scarcely seem to need discussion. Yet the indispensable role of theoretical interpretation what is happening, which we've already thought about, that indispensable role of theoretical interpretation means that significant discovery seldom results simply from a Baconian search for common factors present in the accumulation of particular instances. Francis Bacon, you know, suggested that's sort of how you find out about the world. You look at lots of examples and see what's the common factor between them all. Some discoveries are made that way, of course. But the discovery of truly insightful understanding is a much more complex activity. An exercise of creative imagination is often required in order to discern a truly illuminating underlying pattern. Albert Einstein once said that physical theory had to be freely invented. He was certainly far too strongly convinced that the independent reality of the physical world to mean by that the postmodern notion of a collective collusion in which the scientific community, consciously or unconsciously, agrees to tell a particular story because culturally it likes to see things that way. Instead, Einstein was pointing to the role of an open, intuitive insight in gaining an understanding of reality. Einstein himself did not derive his revolutionary ideas of special relativity from brooding on the failure of the Michelson Morley experiment to detect a non zero velocity through the ether. <coughs> but he, he found, made discoveries principally by thinking, imaginatively thinking, clearly about the experience of an observer traveling on the front of a light wave. Now, of course, the ideas derived from such creative exercise of scientific imagination have subsequently to be tested against empirical evidence. Einstein's theory of general relativity, for example, originated in his wrestling with the implications of the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass. The resistance of a body to having its motion changed and the effect of gravity on that, that, that body are proportional to each other. <clears throat> and that meant that <clears throat> the paths of such bodies through a gravitational field were universal. Double the mass of the moving object double the force of gravity on it, it moves in the same way. That meant instead of thinking about uh, bodies moving uh, separately, you would think of the deviations in their, uh, their movements as being due to the curvature of space-time itself. Physics could be turned into geometry in that way. It was a fantastically brilliant, brilliant idea. And that was a great discovery. <laughs> But when eventually he conceived the equations that expressed this principle of equivalence, he immediately had to work out what the consequences of them would be <coughs> for celestial mechanics. When he found out that these equations successfully predicted a known effect in the motion of the planet Mercury, an, eff an effect which had defied Newtonian explanation, he said it was the happiest day of his life, and I can well believe that it was. <coughs> However, achieving deep explanatory insight through a single creative leap of the scientific imagination, as Einstein did 
in his relativistic discoveries. That's pretty uncommon, actually. More often, discovery is made by a patient step-by-step -step process, a process in which we can discern three successive phases. The first step is what physicists call phenomenology, the discernment of an interesting pattern that suggests the possible existence of an underlying ordering principle without disclosing the actual nature of that principle. Something's going on, there's something to find out. In the long road of the discovery of quantum theory, an initial step of this phenomenological kind was the discovery by a Swiss schoolmaster, Bal Balmer, of an intriguing but unexplained numerical formula which neatly fitted the frequencies of the spectral lines of hydrogen. The second step is then usually taken by the construction of models which seek to reproduce the phenomenology of particular regimes without pretending to attain complete consistency or universal applicability. applicability. A quantum example would be Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. It imposed upon an essentially Newtonian picture of the hydrogen atom, a picture of as, as an electron, it's certainly a proton, it imposed upon that picture an entirely ad hoc quantum condition requiring that the electron's angular momentum should only be an integral multiple of Planck's constant. No deep reason was given for this rule. Of course, its imposition was quite in contradiction to Newtonian thinking. Yet, yet, yet it re reproduced exactly the Balmer formula, formula. Bohr was clearly onto something with this brilliant piece of tinkering with classical physics. The apparent arbitrariness and dubious consistency of his model meant that it could, no more, it could be no more than a significant staging post on the way to a more intellectually satisfying understanding. This latter understanding would in fact be attained 13 years later when the fundamental formulations of quantum mechanics discovered independently and in different forms by Erwin Schrödinger and Werner Heisenberg. At last, at that point, after many years of labor, an understanding had been attained, characterized by a wide applicability and manifest internal consistency, and so deserving the honorific title of quantum theory. So it's phenomenology to models to theory, which is the process of discovery that I'm trying to describe. A fundamental scientific theory such as quantum mechanics often convinces not only by its comprehensive power to explain known phenomena, by its ability to predict new and hitherto unexpected phenomena. When Paul Dirac, who is my great scientific hero, when Paul Dirac discovered an equation which elegantly combined quantum theory with special relativity, he not only found that it gave a natural and unforced explanation of what had seemed to be an anomaly in the magnetic properties of the electron, but he was also led to the prediction of the totally un unsuspected existence of antimatter. Uncovenanted fruitful of this kind is a prime encouragement for physicists to embrace a realist account of the knowledge that they acquire. How could such marvelous explanatory fertility be supposed to arise except by, the cor by correspondence the way things actually are? Dirac was also able to show a little bit later that by applying quantum theory to the electromagnetic field led to a demonstration of the rational possibility of wave-particle duality. Life sometimes, as you know, behaves like waves, sometimes like particles. A duality which has seemed so strangely paradoxical a property when thought about classically. These are astonishing achievements, and it's a wonderful intellectual story. <coughs> One import, further important lesson needs to be drawn from physics before we turn to this consider the path of discovery in theology. Despite its remarkable successes, it turns out that physics by itself is not able to settle all questions about the nature of the physical world. For example, quantum physics is unquestionably probabilistic. We cannot say when a particular radioactive nucleus will decay, but only it has a certain probability of doing so within the next hour. However, 
this probabilistic character might arise for two quite different reasons. One would simply be an unavoidable epistemic ignorance of all the factors which, if they were known, would in fact suffice completely to determine when the decay would occur. In a picturesque way, you might suppose that each nucleus had a, something like an internal clock which specified exactly the time of its particular decay. But the reading these clocks was intrinsically inaccessible to the experimentalist. That's one possible source of probabilistic uh, theory. But an alternative, a more radical reason, the existence of an actual ontological indeterminacy in nature. Under the influence of Niels Bohr, <clears throat> the early quantum theorists adopted this latter point of view, and they had been followed in this by the great majority of succeeding generations. However, in the 1950s, David Bohm produced an alternative interpretation of quantum theory, <coughs> which is in fact deterministic in its fundamental character. Nevertheless, he yields the same experimental predictions, the same probabilistic predictions, as the Bohr model. Bohr achieved this feat by divorcing wave and particle, which Bohr had decreed were complementary aspects of a single entity. In the Bohm theory, there are particles which are as unproblematically objective as even Isaac Newton himself would have wished them to be. But there is also a hidden wave encapsulating information about the whole environment and influencing the motion of the particles in so exquisitely sensitive a manner as to reproduce probabilistic predictions in precise accord with experiment. So there's, 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 there's Bohr, there's Bohm. There's intrinsic uh, indeterminacy. <coughs> there is uh, exquisite but hidden sensitivity. <coughs> the empirical equivalence of these two descriptions, interpretations, means that the choice between them must be made on grounds lying outside of physics itself. They are empirically equivalent. The vast majority of physicists side with Bohr against Bohm, not just because the former's interpretation was in the field first, because the latter's ideas, Bohm's ideas, though certainly instructive and ingenious, have an air and contrivance about them which is metaphysically unattractive. Putting it bluntly, they seem too clever by heart. <laughs> For example, Bohm's wave must satisfy a wave equation, of course. To get the right results, it turns out that this equation, you'll be surprised to learn if you didn't know it already, turns out to be the Schrodinger equation. Now, Bohm simply took that equation over from a conventional quantum theory without offering any independent motivation for the choice beyond that of the need to get the right answers. Thus, it is clear that the fundamental question of the nature of causality, very fundamental question of the nature of causality, is it, is it deterministic or is it indeterministic, while constrained by physics, requires also an act, a metaphysical decision for its settlement. The choice between Bohr and Bohm is a metaphysical decision, based, as I say, on things like a certain naturalness in, in Bohm's interpretation, which seems to most of us to be lacking in Bohm's interpretation. Now, I want to suggest that there is a degree of cousinly relationship between the path of discovery in physics and the path of discovery in theology. And I should use Christology as my example for comparison. <clears throat> when one reads the testimony of the New Testament, one finds its authors wrestling with the problem of how they are to express what they believe to be their experiences of the risen Christ and the transformation he has brought into their lives. This is what one might call the phenomenology of early Christian belief. It includes, of course, the accounts of the appearances of the risen Christ and the story of the empty tomb. And the evidence thus presented has to be assessed with intellectual scrupulosity. It's not my present purpose in this address to deal with that task. I've attempted it elsewhere in my Gifford lectures, The Faith of a Physicist. I shall rest content with saying that I believe there are good grounds for taking this testimony, this phenomenology, if you like, very seriously. Uh, believing that Jesus was indeed raised from death to an unending life of glory, that his followers experienced a power in their lives, which they rightly attributed to the inner working of the divine Holy Spirit. In my view, the credibility of Christian belief pivots on these phenomena. 
just as quantum theory pivots on phenomena such as discrete atomic spectra and wave particle duality. The New Testament witnesses found that their experiences of Jesus Christ could not adequately be expressed without recourse to using divine sounding language about him. The traditional Jewish categories for speaking about remarkable inspired people, such as prophet or teacher or healer, these categories were just not sufficient. Despite many of the New Testament writers, in fact most of the New Testament writers being monotheistic Jews, the early Christians found that to understand the significance of Jesus, <clears throat> they used, needed to use models which made use of categories employing language, language which really belonged to the God of Israel, such as Lord or wisdom. Paul calls Jesus Lord, as I'm sure you know, more than 200 times in his letters. And those letters are commonly prefaced by the greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A phrase whose remarkable implications deserve to be pondered. Jesus is being bracketed here with the one true God of Israel. And given the title Lord, habitually used by pious Jews as a circumlocution for the unutterably sacred name of God. It's a model. As is the way with models, at this stage many issues remain unresolved. How does the Lordship of Christ relate to the Lordship of God? In the New Testament, experience is all, and theory of making had to wait. However, such a situation is intellectually unstable, and of course subsequent Christian generations had to attempt the task of Christological theory making. Now the search for a comprehensive theoretical understanding is bound to be less successful in the case of the infinite reality of God who transcends humanity than it has been for the case of the physical world which we transcend and can put to the experimental test. The first phase of attempts at Christological theory making culminated of course in the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451. This doctrine of the two nations of Christ is more a demarcation of the area in which theological discourse must be contained if it is to be true to the foundational record of the New Testament and the continuing worshipful experience of the church if it is to be true to them than a comprehensive solution of the mystery of the nature of Christ. Debate, debate and further exploration has of course continued in the centuries that follow. Just as a successful scientific theory can shed new light on past perplexities, so I believe that Christian orthodoxy offers some distinct help in facing one of theology's most disturbing problems, the relationship between God and the sufferings of the divine creation. The doctrine of the Incarnation asserts that in Christ, God fully shared in human life, even to the point of participation in suffering and death and the paradoxical experience of divine absence expressed in the cry of dereliction from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Christian God is not simply a compassionate spectator of the travail of creation, looking down upon it from the invulnerability of heaven, but is truly, in Whitehead's famous phrase, though in a more profound sense than he intended, a fellow sufferer who understands. While this deep insight, uniquely Christian insight, does not remove all perplexity about the problem of, su problem of suffering, it seems to me to meet it at the profound level which that problem demands to be addressed. I have been arguing that the strategy of recourse to well-motivated belief is a factor that science and theology have in common in their quest for truthful understanding. I now wish to draw attention to two other aspects of the search for truth, which I also believe they both share. The first is the frank recognition, and in both cases, the degree of success that is capable of being achieved is at best characterized as being reliable insight rather than an indubitable proof. In other words, they both offer illuminating understanding to which it is entirely reasonable to commit oneself without either being able to claim absolutely certain knowledge which only the incurably stupid could question. In fact, I believe that the category of proof in that strict logical sense is one that is far less widely applicable than we commonly recognize. 
you will recall, that Kurt Gödel showed that even in mathematics, an axiomatized mathematical system sufficiently complex to contain the integers cannot establish by internal argument its own consistency. Now, not many people lay awake at night worrying about the consistency of arithmetic, <laughs> but nevertheless, it seems to require an act of commitment going beyond simple assent to what is unquestionably provable. Now, Michael Polanyi is someone who has explored extensively the need in science for acts of intellectual daring going beyond what is absolutely certain in the quest for insight. He tells us that he wrote his great book, Personal Knowledge, to show how he might commit himself to what he believes scientifically to be true, while knowing that it might be false. He's talking about science, remember. Commit myself to what I believe to be true, knowing that it might be false. Many considerations led him to make this, perhaps at first sight, surprising statement. People sometimes say that scientists doubt everything. In actual fact, this would, of course, be a disastrous strategy to pursue, for it would simply lead to intellectual paralysis. Natural history ends and science begins precisely when we interrogate the world from a chosen interpretative point of view, and hence the inescapable circular interaction between theory and experiment that we noted earlier. Unless we are prepared to don what N.R. Hansen, philosopher of science, called theoretical spectacles behind the eyes, we shall not be able to see very far. Of course, the prescription of these spectacles may need to change from time to time. Our theoretical science is not incorrigible, and must be open to correction under the pressure of the way things actually turn out to be. The process of these occasional adjustments is a subtle matter, which I feel is better ca captured by Imre Lakatos's concept of a research program than by Karl Popper's uncompromising, uncompromising account of falsification. It's significant, isn't it, that Popper wanted to talk about the logic of scientific discovery. But the process of discovery is more delicate than the following of an inflexible logical protocol. In a Lakatosian research program, there is a hard core of basic postulates which defines the program and which will only be revised under severe and sustained empirical pressure. For example, in the Newtonian program of celestial mechanics, the hard core was constituted by the idea of universal inverse square law gravitation. The core is buffered from direct vulnerability to individual empirical results by a belt of what Lakatos called auxiliary hypotheses, which determine how the core ideas are to be applied in particular instances. In order to save the program, these hypotheses are capable of being adjusted under empirical pressure. For example, in the Newtonian program, the auxiliary hypotheses would include assumptions about the number and nature of the planets. When it was found that Uranus was not behaving as predicted, the Newtonian program was not abandoned, but a new hypothesis was introduced, the existence of a further planet lying beyond Uranus. The subsequent discovery of Neptune was a stunning success for the program. However, this strategy of adjustment may fail on another occasion. The attempt to deal with an anomaly in the predicted motion of Mercury by assuming the existence of an unobserved planet Vulcan close to the Sun did not work. Eventually, the Newtonian program, as we've seen, had to give way to the Einsteinian program, whose hard core was general relativity. Radical revision is sometimes called for in science, which is why its success cannot be claimed to be absolute truth, but rather the more modest attainment of verisimilitude, the making of maps of physical reality that are reliable on a given scale, which may need alteration when the scale is changed, and new aspects of the landscape are brought into view. The old understandings are not then wholly abandoned. In fact, Newton can tell you how to get a space probe to Mars but they need to be modified and extended to do justice in a wider context. That is why the achievement of science must be described in terms of the attainment of critical realism in that sense. 
Polanyi also drew attention to another important aspect of the character of science. The subject of his book is called Personal Knowledge because he knew, not least from his own direct experience as a very distinguished physical chemist, he knew that the progress of science depends upon the exercise of tacit skills of judgment, which are too subtle to be reduced to the following of a set of specified rules whose execution could be then be delegated to a computer. How to participate in the process of science dis discovery is an art which has to be learnt by persons who are serving an apprenticeship in a truth-seeking community. A frequent Polanyi phrase is, we know more than we can tell. There are tacit skills of discovery. Doing science is more like riding a bicycle than assembling a model aeroplane kit. For example, the experimentalist must always be sensitive to the problems of background, as to say the need to eliminate or allow for spurious events due to random environmental effects that may contaminate the phenomenon supposed to be under investigation. There is no little black book or handy computer program guaranteed to tell us exactly how this can be achieved. Instead, dealing with possible background effects requires the exercise of tacit skills of judgment acquired through long experience. And of course, sometimes mistakes can be made. I could tell you some bad stories about that. And for a while, false results accepted. There's no a priori certainty for success. There is need for scrupulous and careful assessment in the search for results deserving of committed belief. Theorists also need tacit skills. Einstein was able to write down, write down <coughs> the fundamental equations of general relativity, not by following, following some algorithmic procedure, but by a great creative leap, leap of the imagination, in which he was guided by the conviction that the successful equations would have qualities of elegance and economy in a world would exhibit mathematical beauty, properties, properties whose discernment calls for intuitive powers of perception. We have seen that there is an irreducible element of metaphysical judgment involved in discussing deep matters, such as the nature of causality. A desirable metaphysical property is what one may call naturalness of explanation, a lack of manifest contrivance in the formulation of a theoretical proposal. And this is an evaluation which again calls the exercise of tacit skills of judgment. If science does not trade in proof, in that logical, absolute sense. This, of course, is even more clearly true of theology. Religious believers walk by well-motivated faith, but not by certain sight. I have suggested that there are good reasons to believe in the truth of Christ's resurrection. It is not possible logically, I think, to defeat a resolute skeptic like David Hume, whose naturalistic conviction that what usually happens must be what always happens led him to the assertion that whatever the evidence may be offered in their support, the stories of resurrection appearances could be no more than legendary accretions. Nevertheless, no one is yet need condemn themselves to so impoverished a view of reality. <clears throat> in Western thinking, there have been two principal metaphysical traditions differing from each other in what they treat as their basic brute facts. Nothing comes of nothing, and the explanatory scheme of every worldview must have its own defining basis, which provides the assumed and unexplained foundation for the development of further understanding. Naturalism, which is one of the traditions, takes the existence of the physical world as its brute fact. Theism takes the existence of a divine creator as its fundamental basis. The contemporary revival of a revised form of natural theology stems from the claim, largely from the claim, that the laws of nature, as modern physics has discovered them, have a form so remarkable in character that to treat them simply as given brute fact is intellectually unsatisfying. They seem to point beyond themselves to the need to attain a deeper intelligibility. The rational transparency and rational beauty of the physical universe, the features that give research scientists the reward of the experience of wonder for the weary labor of doing research. The, the, these, these, the, the rational transparency and rational beauty of the physical universe is such that many of us feel these properties are best understood 
a sign that the mind of the world's creator lies, is the source of this marvelous order. The finely tuned specificity of the laws of nature, which alone has admitted the universe to be capable of evolving a fertile complexity of carbon-based life, similarly held to be best understood, exhibiting the purpose of the world, well, the will, purpose of will of the world's creator. Now these are not knockdown arguments, giving theistic belief an irresistible logical force. They offer deep insights into remarkable facts about the world, which otherwise would have to be treated as extraordinarily happy accidents. An important desirable feature in any profit metaphysical scheme is its wide scope of explanatory success. Since the day when James Clark Maxwell wrote down his celebrated equations in writing the seemingly different phenomena of electricity and magnetism, there has been a continuous drive in physics to find ever more comprehensive unified theories that authenticity is persuasive because of the wide range of phenomena that they accommodate. This quest has led to great progress in scientific understanding. Beyond science itself, a similar motiv motivation to seek a unified view should prevail. Atheists are by no means stupid, and many are, I believe, genuine truth seekers. But the defenders of theistic metaphysics can claim that it explains more than atheism ever can. One final cousinly relationship between science and theology, I believe, needs to be noted. Both of them need to operate what might call an open rationality. The essence of reason is to conform one's thinking to the actual nature of what it is one is trying to think about. And if science ceases at anything, it is sure that reality is often surprising, manifesting properties that were beyond our human powers to anticipate. The biologist J.B.S. Haldane, writing in the late 1920s about the quantum discoveries of his physicist colleagues, said that not only had it turned out the universe was queerer than we thought, but queerer than we could have thought, <laughs> without the stubborn nudge of nature pressing us in a counterintuitive direction. Any philosopher in 1999 could have proved the impossibility of wave-particle duality. How could some, something sometimes be supposed to behave like a spread out and oscillating wave, a flappy sort of thing, or, or, or as a tiny bullet? Nevertheless, of course, that was how light was found to behave. Under pressure of this strange and undeniable fact, physicists were eventually driven to the discovery of quantum theory, as I briefly mentioned earlier. One of the strongest encouragements for taking a realist view of science's achievements is this engagement with the stubborn recalcitrance of nature, so often resisting our prior expectations. Scientists are really encountering an independent reality standing over against us in its idiosyncratic character. This means that science makes it plain there is no universal rationality unproblematically applicable to all entities. For example, I haven't the time to elaborate this point, but for example, Aristotelian logic holds in the everyday world. It's based, of course, on the law of the excluded middle. The billiard ball is either here or it's not here. There's no other possibility. But in the quantum world, a different kind of quantum logic has to hold. Because a quantum entity, like an electron, can be a mixture, an unpicturable mixture of being a bit of here and a bit of there. It's a different kind of logic. So there's no universal rationality in that, in that sense. We have to think about things in ways that accord with their nature. Similarly, there is no universal epistemology. Entities can only be known in ways that accord with their natures. Any attempt to reject Heisenbergian uncertainty, to require to know the quantum world with Newtonian clarity, is simply condemned to failure. In consequence of these facts, the natural question for the scientists to ask, to ask both within science and also beyond it, is not, is it reasonable about a proposition being made? As if we thought we knew beforehand the shape that reason had to take. Wave particle duality didn't look reasonable to anybody in 1899. Instead, the scientists asked, what makes you think 
that might be the case. You see, a question that is once more open doesn't try to lay down the form of an acceptable answer, but also more demanding. If you're going to give me a strange and unexpected answer, you're going to have to produce motivating evidence in support of your strange claim. The adherents of, part of wave particle duality had to cite the interpreted experiences of Young and Maxwell, Planck and Einstein, in support of their strange belief. So the natural question of the scientist within the science and beyond it is what makes you think that might be the case? And I believe that theology also needs to operate, even more so, with an open rationality, making use of the kind of strategy and the quest for truth that I like to call bottom-up thinking. That is to say, moving from carefully evaluated experience in order to reach well-motivated belief from the basement of experience to the ground floor of understanding, which contrasts with a top-down strategy. I believe it is possible to start with clear and certain general principles before descending into consideration of particulars. The trouble with the top-down approach is that too often those clear and certain ideas have in the end turned out to be neither clear nor certain. Under the pressure of actual engagement with reality. I wrote my Gifford lectures to explore a bottom-up approach to orthodox Christian belief, giving the published version, which had a terrible act of misjudgment, has different titles on the two sides of the Atlantic, but over here it's called The Faith of Physicists, I gave both of them the same subtitle, Theological Reflections of a Bottom-Up Thinker. The presence of humanity and deity in the person of Christ is a duality more profound and perplexing, much more profound and perplexing, of course, the wave-particle duality of life. But I believe it is well motivated by the foundational experience and insights recorded in the New Testament, wit Testament witness. The foundational experience and insights recorded in the New Testament witness by the continuing worshipping experience of the church. Theology rightly takes its place as an essential element in the great human quest for truthful understanding attained through the scrupulously assessment of experience. So it is rightly represented in the spectrum of inquiry in a, of a true university. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Polkinghorne. We owe you a great deal of gratitude for helping us to understand that our science can acknowledge self-inconsistency, allowing for purpose and value, and our religion can have real predictive power, allowing the interpersonal, personal, and transpersonal connection that give us purpose and value. We appreciate what you've said today. We have a few minutes for questions. We have a microphone. If you have a question for Dr. Polkinghorne, uh, please come forward. Or a comment, of course. I, mean, I don't uh, stand here knowing all the answers. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid I have to come to the mic. Hi, Dr. Polkinghorne. Uh, Joel Daniels from Boston University. It's very good to see you. Um, uh, from your address, it sounds to me like philosophy of science could be just as much of a resource for scholars who are doing religion and science uh, as anything else. Nothing demythologizes stuff as much as uh, watching it be made, whether science, politics, or science. And philosophy of science seems to really demythologize universal objectivity, um, the role of reason, uh, motivations, uh, and so forth. I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the role, whether philosophy of science could be a resource, a research program, if you will, for religious scholars who are studying science and religion. Well, thank you for saying that. I think, the, I mean, I think my, my talk is partly trying to illustrate, illustrate that, but that's my appeal to something like Lakatos and, and uh, so on. Yes, I mean, I, I do think there is a cousinly relationship between all different um, realms of, of, of quest for truthful understanding. 
and therefore if we reflect methodologically otherwise on the nature of those individual cases, we should see some customary relationships between them. And, that, and uh, yes, I think that, that, that's, that's right. It's possible, I suppose, it's possible that, that in, in uh, perhaps particularly in teaching, I don't know, my, my, perhaps I'm not right about this, but in teaching uh, science and, and religion courses, not in sufficient attention, may sometimes be paid to uh, the interpretive role of, of philosophy. I, I think philosophy is a wonderful handmaid. Like all scientists, I'm a little bit wary of philosophers. Um, <laughs> they, they sometimes have a tendency to come in and say, I'll tell you what you're really doing. <laughs> and I think, I think they have to listen to us <laughs> as, as, as well. But of course, it's, it's very helpful to, to, to have those insights proffered to us. Another question? Chap over here. Thank you so much for your talk. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, given all the surprising discoveries in science the last 50 years, you mentioned quantum theory. Why is it that so few scientists are believers? And as the, the, the statistics say, you go higher up in the scientific community. Uh, there's such a low percentage who say, you know what, this universe is very surprising and I'm open to religious belief. Why doesn't it lead to that openness? That's a very interesting question. I, I, think that, I don't think there's a single answer to that because I think different sciences, um, the, the different scientific communities show different uh, uh, um, uh, responses in that sort of way. Physics looks at a world at a level that I briefly touched on this morning which is full of wonderful order. And, and, and there is a, um, therefore, a sort of almost natural cosmic religiosity to be found among physicists, even if they aren't adherents of any uh, traditional uh, uh, faith position. Einstein, for example, um, uh, said that he felt like a child in the presence of the elders when he made his big discoveries. And he liked to talk about his God, you know, he referred to in comradely terms as the old one, and um, so on. But he also was very emphatic that he saw no sign and did not believe in the personal God of Jews and Christians. And of course, that's not surprising because he wasn't looking in the right place. If you're simply looking at the impersonal investigation of reality that the physics is concerned with, you won't see, you won't see personal things there. Einstein, in fact, uh, once said that his, his move into physics was a flight from the personal to the impersonal. So, that, so there is a cosmic religiosity, but if, unless you're prepared to engage with the possibility of unique, unique illumination. I mean, we all know in personal life that the unique has an irreplaceable role. Only Bach could have written the Mass in B minor. If he, hadn't, if he died before doing that, that great work of art would have been, would have been lost to us. Um, and some, some, some are uncomfortable with that, but if they remember that they're not just scientists, but also persons, I think they'll say that's uh, so. Now, biologists are different, if I may say so, and I realize I know I'm the president of many biologists here, but I look at the biological community, that there's far less, it seems to me, looking at it from the outside, there's far less openness to the possibility of religious belief in that community. Of course, there are very notable exceptions, obviously, but, but uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's the case. And I think there's a number of reasons for it. One is this, this is unfortunate, continuing dickering about evolution, which is not helpful to anybody. So, to my view, it's a very identifying spectacle to see people who I'm sure wish to serve the God of truth turning their backs on other a certain source of truth, which is scientific insight. Another reason, I think, is that, that, uh, that uh, biology has scored fantastic successes. Biology was the, the, the science of the second half of the 20th century, uh, and, and uh, particularly through genetics. And, 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 and the biologists at the beginning of the 21st century seem to be in a rather similar position to the post-Newtonian generation of the physicists in the second half of the 18th century. Tremendous discoveries have been made. First of all, when, you, when that, those discoveries are made, you always, you always discover the mechanical aspect of things before you see things more complex. So it's easier to understand clocks and clouds. And so just as the physicists in the second half of the 18th century were so intoxicated by what they believed to be the mechanical view. Newton, of course, didn't have this view, but the mechanical view of Newtonian physics, they wrote, wrote books like De La Maitrie's book, Man the Machine, and so on. 
Physics has come the other side of that. We find the world is more complex than that, something much more subtle, more interesting uh, than, than, than the mere mechanism. Quantum theory is one striking reason for that, that judgment. And I think that the biology, of course, particularly when it, it, it made wonderful discoveries by looking at molecular processes, and that was clearly a right, right discovery. But when it gets, goes back to be interested uh, more in organisms and their, in their to total complexity, I think it will change. And uh, uh, that, that, that's, 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 that's another reason. Um, but the, there's a, another reason still, which is very important and persisting reason and a true reason, which is the biologists see a much more ambiguous picture of the world than, than, than physicists do. I suppose physicists see wonderful order. Of course, biologists see wonderful fruitfulness, the three and a half billion year history of life, world with bacteria in it for billions of years, now having you and me in it. But they also saw the, see the wastefulness and blind eyes and ragged edges of evolutionary process. It is a much more ambiguous picture. And we, who are religious believers, have to take that absolutely seriously. We're back as we always are in thinking about these things with the problem of evil and suffering, suffering in the world. And I think science has some, some helpful things to say about that, which I, I have the time to elaborate now. But um, so, uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a different story. And I, I suspect that the, the world of the human sciences is, 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 is different again, but I know that world as well. Thank you, Dr. Polkinghorn, Ben Witherington, Asbury Seminary, and St. Andrews. Um, my wife is a scientist. She's a biologist and ecologist. And one of the favorite quotes she likes to use uh, is uh, attributed to Jestrow, who said, I'm afraid that when we have ascended to the top of the knowledge of mountain about the origins of the universe, we will find a theologian sitting on the top of the mountain saying, we told you so. <laughs> Now, what I've always wondered about that is, do you think that one of the reasons the reflex of so many scientists is to hold theology at arm's length or dismiss it is precisely because there, there may be somewhere deep down in there the fear that there might actually be some truth to this theology after all and it might actually have something to do with science after all. And they've spent their whole lives denying that's the case. Do you think that's part of what's going on? Well, I doubt it, it's, 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 I doubt it really. I, um, I mean, the, uh, what I said, remember, was that I think the scientific questions have scientific answers, theological questions have theological answers. Uh, and that we need, we need both sets of answers. And together, they will enable us to see further and deeper than we could with either on its own, I think. The relationship between science, science and theology is much more symbiotic in, in the search for understanding than, than, than perhaps than, than that. I mean, I think that that quotation about calling up the mountain and finding the the, the, the theologian is, is, is it's a very popular one, but it's not it's not terribly popular with me actually. <laughs> <laughs> but different things help different people. I'm not. Uh, David Ramsey, Southeastern Louisiana University, Dr. Falkenhorn. Just uh, a number of years ago, you spoke in the Twelve Oaks Dining Hall at Southeastern. You were there with your wife, uh -huh. and uh, during your presentation, you gave a very uh, moving description of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Southeastern is a public university. It runs very carefully according to the separation of church and state. I told the atheist who coordinated that program after it was over that that was the first time, and it's the only time, I have ever heard the gospel preached in that place. <laughs> so I have a testimony, not a question. <laughs> well, thank you. I, mean, I, I think we have to speak to the truth as we see it, as we have opportunity to speak to the truth. It, it, and we have to we have to wait for the invitation. I'm grateful for the invitation. I had an application. <laughs> 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 <laughs>